in all of the pictures, Kate still looks radiant and beautiful. And she's gone through chemotherapy. Is she a smoker? I don't think she is. Did she have a cheeky cigarette in the past? Probably. Let her get on with getting on. It was nasty. It was catty. It was bitchy. It was about self-advancement. It was about brands Narinda, which frankly, if I was in brand management, I'd tell her, love, go back to drawing board. It ain't working. And breaking right now, fury at Narinda Kerr making a, well, how do I describe this? Attack, I guess, online attack on Catherine, the Princess of Wales, after she appeared looking, I thought, completely beautiful on the balcony on Remembrance Sunday alongside Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh. Now, Narinda was, let's just say, perhaps not putting her best foot forward uh, with this one. She talked about the fact that Catherine was ageing and made no reference to the fact that, of course, she has just gone through one year of chemotherapy. Cue outrage. Chris Rose, post on X, I usually try to ignore her, but Catherine has been in a year-long battle with cancer. She still looks more elegant than Narinda will ever be. Niall Gardner wrote an incredibly nasty tweet from a truly nasty person. The Princess of Wales is courageously recovering from cancer. And then some big celebrities started to weigh in too. Anne Hegarty from The Chase posted on X, I hope you look better than that when you get cancer. Narinda replied saying, that's disgusting. It was a genuine ask. My brother had cancer and died. He didn't age. Why be so despicable? Anne replied, because if she's not looking that great, there's a perfectly obvious reason why. And you don't need to jump to all sorts of obscure conclusions. And obviously, I don't hope you get cancer, but I do hope you have a little more empathy for people who do and who consequently don't look 100%. Alex Phillips, my goodness. What did you make of this? Do you know, I think poor Narinda, right? She thinks that she's trying to hustle, right? To get attention, to get on in career, to get more bookings, to get more followers, um, but she doesn't quite get how to do that, does she? She's trying to be extreme. She's trying to say things that will cause ripples, but and she's doing it, but in the wrong way. She doesn't know how to play the game. So get off the field, I would say. Um, look, I mean, it's when I saw that picture of Kate, I thought, blimey, poor Kate, you know? But, but the other thing I'd say is when a woman has photographs taken in the daylight, you know, it's awful as lighting in terms of uh, how that can make you look. In all of the pictures, Kate still looks radiant and beautiful. And she's gone through chemotherapy. Is she a smoker? I don't think she is. Did she have a cheeky cigarette in the past? Probably. Let her get on with getting on. It was nasty. It was catty. It was bitchy. It was about self-advancement. It was about brands Narinda, which frankly, if I was in brand management, I'd tell her, love, go back to drawing board. It ain't working. You know, you're trying to be too radical. You're trying to get clickbait comments out there. And you're just coming across as slightly unpleasant and unhinged. And I feel sorry, actually, in this instance, in many respects, I kind of feel sorry for Narinda because she's... She's bitten off more than she can chew. You know her, right? I mean, I remember when she went a bit tonto and got slightly obsessed with trying to troll me. And you said to me, you know, I know Narinda. I like Narinda. I reckon you two would get along. So I DM'd Narinda and said, let's go for a drink. And it was, she was kind of instantly hostile. Are you trying to set me up? I was like, no, let's go for a drink. We both know Dan. Anyway, she kept cancelling when it would happen. And then she just started doing the re-bitching again. And I thought, oh, my God, she's just a lost cause. Like, I can't. But I kind of worry for people like her because I think that when people act with that level of vitriol, they're the sort of people who go down in the comments and get really upset about all the negative reactions as well. So it just constantly compounds itself. So in some respects, the person I'm most worried about in, in this instance is actually Narinda because I think she's just making a, a huge mess of what could have been a promising career. Yeah, I feel so sad about what's happened with Narinda, actually, because I knew Narinda in the pre-news phase. I knew Narinda when she was a contestant on Big Brother. She was a great laugh. She was fun to be around. And when I was working on GB News, we were always looking for new and fresh left-wing voices. And I thought, why not? I agree with this woman on lots of things. For example, Narinda was really anti-lockdown. And I never felt any sense of anti-white racism. 
But what I worry about is that there is a certain grift these days, and the grift has been absolutely, uh, I guess you would say, expertly managed by people like Dr. Scholler, who receive honorary doctorates and bookings on the BBC for being racist against white people. And I worry Narinda has been inspired by that because I can't really believe that she hates the country so much that has given all, her all of these incredible opportunities. That really surprises me. But I want to show you what Julie Birchall uh, responded to Narinda because I thought it was fascinating because Narinda, of course, Alex, tried to turn this into a William and Catherine versus Harry and Meghan thing. So Julie Birchall, who used to be a big fan of Meghan Markle, actually, said to Narinda, I'm not a monarchist, but I find this so revolting. Catherine looks her age because she is 42, has experienced a full quota of joy and pain and hasn't had plastics injected into her face. Shame on you, Narinda, for attempting to pathologize the aging process, some woman. Now, Narinda replied, she wasn't backing down, Alex. She said, she had Botox. Stop lying. And you are one to talk with the vile articles you've written about Meghan Markle for years. You are not anyone to talk about me, Julie. I've apologised for my insensitivity, but it was a genuine ask, foolish perhaps, but you have never apologised for your hatred. Now, Julie went on, warn, what a lovely word to use from another woman to another. At least I'm being paid for being a bitch, but I don't think I've ever used that word in my life. I genuinely pity you to use that word of a fellow woman, especially one who has survived cancer. She is the absolute embodiment of my word cry bully. One moment the victim being called fat, big deal, the next victimizing a cancer survivor for not being pretty enough. I hope she gets help. And then, having posted a picture of Narinda, uh, which maybe was not the most flattering, Julie went on to say, Narinda, I suggest you stick this on your fridge door and take a good look at, at it the next time you feel tempted to critique the appearance of a 42-year-old woman who recently underwent chemotherapy for cancer, unless you were going to a costume party as an oven-ready turkey. So, Alex, it all turned pretty nasty. Do you know what? It's it, I'm I'm with Julie Birchall in this. You know, if you're going to be a bitch, expect people to be a bitch to you and suck it up. And uh, the left are the bullies in this. You know, I'm speaking to this uh, wonderful girl who came to see me today called Ellie. She is in the sixth form. She wants to become a journalist. She loves reform. And she messaged me on Instagram and just said, I really like you. And, and I replied to her. She's like, oh, I can't believe you're taking the time to reply. We got talking. And she's doing a project as part of her A-levels, doing interviews. Anyway, she came to um, interview me today. And uh, in talking to her, she's saying that she gets so much flack at school when she says she likes Trump. Well, not even, she doesn't even say she likes Trump, but the teacher's like, oh, he's mad and he's going to kill everyone and blah, 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 blah. And when she tries to stand up and said, that's not true, the flack she's oh. getting at school school she's like 16 or something right. and I said to her what you need to understand is they might be the ones who cry victim victim hatred hatred they are the bullies mm. so when people talk to you like that when people try and silence you when people are behaving like Narinda just take a step back and go these people are bullies and normally when people end up becoming bullies it's because they're very unhappy in themselves and it's interesting that Julie Birchall sort of ended the tweet before that tweet before oven ready turkey by saying, I hope she gets help, because that's what it looks like, okay? To the average person, the way she's talking, the way she's acting, the way she's desperately trying to get clickbait by saying irrational things, unpleasant things, um, it, it, it's alarming, you know? And I, I do, I, I'm, it, it, like I said, in this situation, part of me kind of wants to pick up the phone to her, but pick, pick up the phone to Narinda, not that she'd answer it, but just say, are you all right? You know, let's go for a drink. Let's just, you know, let's sit down. Can I give you some friendly advice? I think you'd get so much further in your career. I think you'd sell yourself better as a product. I think you'd represent your arguments a lot better. I think that you'd be of more value in the media sphere if you kind of just took a few steps back and, 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 and you know, looked at the sort of things you're saying and doing and realised that this isn't good. Exactly. This you can have an argument. We can fundamentally disagree on things, by the way, including whether we think Harry and Meghan have done the right thing without immediately bringing it back to race and this idea that if you make any form of criticism, you've got to be some big racist. But Narinda did hit back today 
And unfortunately, and I will say this, Narinda, I think it's very, very sad that immediately she went down the path of the race grift. Watch this. There's a lot of misinformation and facts matter. So you've all come at me about the cancer. It was pre-cancer cells as far as I'm aware. She's had near enough a year of work. Um, of course, it must take its toll. I've known plenty of people who've been in and out, in a hospital and out for precancerous treatment, and they're back at work. People suffer all day long, and they work, and they have to work. My own brother worked up until weeks before he died. So Kate does have a lot of privilege there. I'm not excusing my tweet, but what I'm saying is you all are mad at me but you're not mad at the fact her husband and her father-in-law profit from cancer charities. That they don't pay tax due. That they profit from the army and from charities, cancer charities. You're not mad about that. But you're mad at me. And I tell you something else that was very good telling. That a, most of the, a lot of the comments were all about when Meghan Markle, what's Meghan got to do with it? It, you know what you did? You exposed your narrative. But Alex, hasn't she exposed her narrative? Because I, I need to actually just show you the tweet in full because I haven't actually done that yet. This was the tweet. Genuine question. Why has Kate aged so much? Isn't she only 42? Is she a smoker? That's the only explanation. Now, come on. There's, there's nothing to do with Harry and Meghan there. She's she's gone. She's balmy. I feel sorry for her. It, she's about two weeks away from doing one of those crying selfies on, you know, sitting in the front seat of a car on TikTok. You know, because that's what happens, getting a short fringe like this and carrying placards. Uh, these people aren't well. I mean, I just don't think they're well. Like I said, something funny happens when people feel they've got to keep doing this stuff to advance their career. You know, go along with this narrative, make these comments, tug their forelock at this new set of ideologists to advance their careers. And they gaslight themselves so much that they become deluded. And then they're locked in this maelstrom of confusion where they're so convinced. It's a bit like becoming a religious convert to a cult. You know, when people go around going, you know, the end of the worldists or something. You kind of think, are you okay? How did that happen? These people are kind of the same thing. It's it, it's a cult ideology. It's a strange sort of syndrome that happens. And it's because, you know, people of maybe not so high intelligence or emotional intelligence think that this is the path to follow to get to where they think they want to be and where they think they can handle. And every step they take down the path the closer they're getting to some mad level of indoctrination where, like I said, in a couple of weeks' time, she's going to be like, oh, on TikTok in her car. They always do it in the car. I don't know yes. why. Um, I worry for her. We're partnered with Gundry MD to share this information with, with you. Uh, would you believe me if I told you inside your pantry right now is one of the healthiest foods on the planet? Yep, it's true. And it's not some weird, trendy superfood. Spoiler alert, it's olive oil. You're probably used to cooking with it, but there are countless ways to use olive oil and it will make you look and feel younger. For example, olive oil is a natural way to help you achieve a more youthful appearance. Besides helping you look younger on the outside, it's a fantastic tool for your insides as well. According to Dr. Stephen Gundry, a famous cardiothoracic surgeon, nutrition expert, and health advocate, you should get as much high-quality olive oil into your daily routine as possible, whether it's taking a shot of it daily or keeping a bottle of it in your bathroom medicine cupboard. But what kind of olive oil is best for your health? Well, any olive oil can give you some benefits, but if you're looking to get the best results, it matters a lot which one you pick. The olive oil industry is huge. You can tell by the number of olive oil brands you see at the grocery store. And you can bet they're not all made with the consumer in mind. And many brands may even cut corners one way or another to increase profits. When Dr. Gundry came to this realisation, he was appalled. But some olive oils are so powerful, it may only take a few tablespoons a week to see those incredible health benefits. So how can you tell? 
between an olive oil that can be a health booster and one which isn't up to par. In an effort to answer that question, Dr. Gundry has decided to take a stand and release his personal research and findings. Now, this video has gone viral since its release, and it's important you see it so you can start benefiting immediately. You can watch the video right now by going to getolive1.com forward slash outspoken or by clicking the link in the description box below. That's get the number one dot com slash outspoken or just click on the link in the description box below. People who have taken his advice have shared their results with him, saying the olive oil they bought after learning his simple rules have helped change their lives. So make sure you go to getolive1.com forward slash outspoken or click on the link in the description box below. Alex, can I just ask uh, your view overall on how William and Catherine have coped with this year? Because just a couple of days ago, William gave much more of a personal interview than we usually see from him, describing this as a brutal year, the hardest year of his life, which is saying something, given that he lost his mother in 1997. And of course, it's not just the fact that Catherine and King Charles, his father, have been battling cancer. So much of the difficulty has come from the intense, negative, often untrue and vile criticism that has come from trolls online. Right. Not just that, you know, it's interesting. Look at look at his father, right? <laughs> to become the king, to get the most important, biggest job in the country, the biggest role of your life, your parent has to die, right? So you're in the middle of bereavement and your parent has to die for you to assume this really challenging role that's going to change your life forever. So that's what happened to, for Charles. Then Charles got cancer and Kate also got cancer at the same time. So who's got to somehow step step up to the plate, William. So William has not only got to have all these personal emotional feelings, he's feeling about the welfare and the struggle and the suffering of his father and his wife. And he will see that suffering firsthand. He will be there mopping the tears. He will be there, you know, holding the hand. He will be there, you know, being the physical support, carrying someone to a toilet, holding the sick bucket. I mean, who knows what he's had to go through privately behind the scenes and yes they might have help but that doesn't in any way change the trauma and the, the the hardship of this awful disease which takes no prisoners whether you're poor or whether you're a millionaire and actually just because you've got money in the bank and you live in a sort of you know big house it doesn't mean you suffer things less it doesn't mean your emotions suddenly dissipate you know in fact usually the opposite happens when people have all that they want yeah. in life they suddenly find themselves pretty sad but mm. not only has William had to deal with whatever his wife's been going through his kids as well you know what are they feeling like he's also had to essentially assume the position of the most senior royal keep the whole ship going be the commander while his father and his wife were incapacitated. I mean, could you even imagine the average person going through that? It's absolutely insane. Have they ha handled it well? Yes. They've handled it the only way they could handle it. To see Charles and Camilla doing their royal tour down under, that's a grueling flight. It's a busy diary. And they looked so relaxed and so happy. And yes, there were a few sort of Republican nutters screaming stuff at them. But the reception's been joyful. And most of the country and most of the world love our royal family. And you know what? A lot of people adore Kate. They adore William. They're, they're kind of in a weird way looking forward to when William is king because they see something in him. They see this humanity in the eyes. They see something that they can connect to. They, he's probably, I think, the first royal who's going to become king who really is emotionally accessible who we look at and we kind of you know it, it's like we went to school with him or like he's our brother or something we we get him he's reveals so much more of himself than anyone has done um and he looks he looks tired you know he looks like he's lost loads of weight I, you know, he's got that beard, but I don't know. His face is, is not as plump as it used to be. Um I, I think that you know People think that, oh, wow, you've got an equerry and you've got horses in stables and golden carriages. That must be lovely. 
it's a job very few people would want. Oh, 100%. It's a bloody hard job. 100%. And it's kind of as a mascot, as a human mascot. I yeah. mean, it's... And it's Catherine bad. cannot win. Come on, Catherine cannot win because... When she turned up at Trooping the Colour, for example, everyone was saying, oh, she almost looks too good. How can she possibly have gone through chemotherapy? Then at the weekend, oh, she looks tired. I mean, look, they are in such an unenviable position. And I think that type of criticism is, is completely unnecessary. But look, Alex, it has been so lovely to have you today. And here it is. That's what she said by Alex Phillips. On Substack, I'm one of Alex's first subscribers. She's got brilliant <laughs> interviews with everyone from Sebastian Gorka to Tommy Robinson and Nigel Farage. And Alex, I'm just so glad that you are now in this independent media sphere because this is the future, right? It is, and it's so good being part of the stack crew. I just want to say again, apologies for the noise. Like I said, I'm coming, I'm broadcasting from a pub from real Britain. You're and about just... to party now, aren't you? You're going to have oh, your gin and tonics. I'm oh, jealous. I'm going to go and cook dinner or something. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you can tell the, the village pub is beginning to fill up now and the noise has increased. Um, they've been really good hosting me, the Royal Oak in Easterton. Uh, it wasn't by design, by the way, um, but uh, we couldn't get Wi-Fi to work at, at the cottage. Well, no, it's, Alex, it has been such a joy. I mean, goodness me, we went through the launch of GB News together. We didn't know each other before that at all. And I think we had so much hope and excitement about that project. Maybe it didn't quite work out in the way that we intended. But I think what was incredible uh, were the human relationships that were built over that time. And I look at those people who were there in the early days, like you and Gloria and Liam Halligan and Mercy Morokin, I think, wow, they are they are bonds for a lifetime because we went through something. And now it's really amazing to uh, hopefully help each other out on this new independent journey. Thank you, Dan. Honestly, it's been such a privilege. I just adore you. I think you're one of the kindest, most intelligent, quick, innovative, industrious, brilliant people. I mean, you know, you're just a phenomenon. You are incredible. And it's just been a, a super privilege. And so nice of you to have me on, on your show. And I well, you've got to have nice. me on Cider House Rules next, okay? I'm already with Cider. I must admit, I'm sort of breaking my own rules by having a gin and tonic like that. But um, we, you are coming on and you're going to be drinking a lot of scrumpy. Well, you know, I love a cider. I love a cider. So I am well up for it. But no, Alex Phillips, you're absolutely amazing. Such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Dan Wooten Outspoken. Please click on my face just to the bottom left to subscribe to this brand new independent news source and turn on the notification bell so you'll be alerted to our brand new live shows, uncancelled interviews, and special royal episodes. Outspoken is also now available as a podcast, so you can listen to the show every weekday, on the go, wherever you are. 